My name is Nancy Fulton, and I currently run events for more than 25,000 entertainment industry pros. And they cover everything from uh, how to produce a film to uh, avoiding litigation. We're going to be interviewing attorney Justin Sterling, who's going to be talking about ways to stay out of the courtroom, which is important for most of us because people in the entertainment industry do more deals in a year than most people do in a decade and many people do in a lifetime. So Justin, with your permission, I'll go ahead and I'll do the slide set. And I think you're going to be spending like three to five minutes per slide. And some of the topics, you know, will take more time and less time. Well, we should give a disclaimer that um, if anyone has questions, I believe they're going to go through Nancy. Um, but let's keep everything general, not specific, because their attorney-client privilege is not in effect here. And there's other people on the line. So if you have personal issues, let's please make a, uh, a consultation with an attorney and speak confidentially. I should say that there's... Okay, so there, there's different types of attorneys. There's your transactional attorneys, there's your litigation attorneys, and there's your trial attorneys. Transaction attorneys will help you with uh, forming your contracts uh, and as entertainment professionals to have your, uh, a clear chain of title and to make sure you secure all the intellectual property rights. Litigation usually is when uh, a dispute happens. You should, you should speak to an attorney once there is, um, there's a, a controversy, is what we call it. Um, once there's a, a dispute, and a lot of times it's over money, there's a mountain controversy, you should speak to an attorney and there sh should be uh, proper legal actions you can take, what we call causes of actions, and you can pursue a lawsuit. A trial attorney is once you go through the litigation process, the discovery phase, there's a lot of motions at work, uh, the trial attorney actually presents the show, the show to a jury, uh, members of your community. And those are the people who are the, um, they are the triers of fact. Our legal system is probably the most amazing legal system in the world. Where else in the world can you be tried amongst your peers? Other jurisdictions, other countries, other systems, uh, you're a king, there's, uh, there's one person making decisions. Here, we're a community, and there's no other system like that. Um, and then also in the civil realm, because we're speaking about litigation here, uh, civil litigations, when we're attempting to recover for torts and breaches of contract, and we're seeking basically monetary damages, compensation, expectation interest for breaches of contracts, um, or your, your fair compensation from uh, intellectual property rights, uh, people are exploiting your rights without your permission. Um, we're in the civil realm and there's different legal standards that apply. It's not your criminal legal standard, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. Here it's uh, by the preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not. And that's why a lot of this presentation, um, I'll be speaking from a litigation and a trial point of view and I'll be telling you from, you know, what you'll need in the beginning when you form your transactions in order to meet uh, those particular standards and prove your case if a dispute ever arises. Uh, you can proceed. That was just kind of just a background information. So myths that people believe about litigation. I guess the point here is that you should know who you're doing business with. Trust the people you're working with because you just never know what's going to happen. They can still sue you. And in fact, if you don't have any assets, assets that you may gain in the future could be used to uh, satisfy any judgment. Uh, myth number two, I didn't do anything wrong, so I can't be sued. Kind of along the same lines. Uh, you know, especially in America and California in particular, where a lot of entertainment deals are done, uh, we're very litigious. We're a litigious society. California in particular, because there's so many codes on the books. It's so many, there's a code section for cutting your grass, uh, practically. It's uh, a very codified state. And uh, not to mention California is probably the leading state with the number of attorneys. Uh, I heard once that California has more attorneys uh, in its state bar than there are dentists in the rest of the country. So that tells you there's a lot of attorneys in California. Um, there's some very good attorneys too. It's a, uh, 
you know, the state bar, California, is, it's a very good state bar. Um, myth number three, I can't afford to sue anyone, even if I have been wronged. Well, here we should speak about uh, contingency fees for attorneys. Many attorneys can take an interest in the case where they're paid uh, if there's any settlement or judgment obtained. With that being said, in certain cases, it's not very likely that you could get retained an attorney on a contingency fee basis. Intellectual property disputes, business disputes, many times are taken on an hourly basis. Um, the civil realm is not like the criminal realm where you uh, are afforded an attorney, uh, a public defender in the case of a, a criminal case. Um, here in the civil realm, right, you can proceed in pro per, you can represent yourself, um, or you can retain an attorney. Uh, proceeding in pro per is very difficult. However, the courts are more lenient to in pro per litigants. Uh, that being said, it would be very difficult to go against uh, a defense, uh, another attorney being an in pro per. Although I do a lot of volunteer work with many pro bono clinics uh, in the Los Angeles community, and there are some very, very bright uh, pro per litigants. Um, many times, though, they're very, um, well, you know, they bring a lot of lawsuits. So that's not always a good sign either. So if you're really considering litigation, you should give it very, uh, very strong consideration. Consult with an attorney. Many attorneys will give free consultations. Uh, I myself also give free consultations, although there, it must be a line dr uh, drawn to how much um, consultation you can provide and what kind of advice can be provided in those consultations, if any, because if you rely on that advice and it's professional liability uh, incurs on the attorney. So um, there are, are also many free legal clinics in the community. Uh, I volunteer with the Mesero Free Legal Clinic in uh, Inglewood. And then also in Los Angeles, there is the uh, lawyers in the law library program every third Friday of the month. Really, when you do business with others, it's a, a relationship of trust. You should know who you're doing business with. Uh, you should do your due diligence. You should do investigation uh, in the entertainment industries. Uh, distributor, distributors should be investigated and know what uh, they have put out, what have they have exploited in the past to see if they're credible because there's a lot of puffery and there's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, fraud that takes place in industry and, and business in general. So you have to do your due diligence. There's private investigators you can hire. There's different types of searches you can do. Uh, you can do IP searches. Uh, you can search whether uh, someone has copyrights in their name with the Copyright Office, also the United States Trademark and Patent Office. You can also go down to the county recorder to see if there's any properties and if there's any liens on those properties. Uh, the more liens there are, it's, uh, that may be a yellow flag. You can search court records and find out if any lawsuits have been filed against them or uh, by them. Uh, both I would you know, look into whether they've been sued many times. It may show that they are not very trustworthy. And if they bring a lot, a lot of lawsuits, then that means you may be dealing with someone who's rather quick to pursue litigation, which could be a, a costly uh, expense. So that would also be a, a yellow flag. Giving away ownership without accountability. And really, you know, I could go on, on, on and on about any of these mistakes. And there's so much into each one. Um, giving away ownership without a, accountability. This really goes down to having clear terms uh, written out in contracts. And if you're doing business with others, um, the dreaded partnership agreement, very, always be careful when you enter partnerships because when you enter a partnership, you uh, take on the, the risk. Uh, you take on personal liability. You're not protected by a corporate bail. And what your partner does, you could be liable for, and it, your personal assets could also be liable. So it's very 
uh, important to consult the right professionals, an attorney, uh, an accountant, uh, to get the right business structure set up. You want to be protected and you also want to be, um, you want to have your partner accountable. And if you're only putting in a certain amount, you only want to be accountable to that ma amount. Um, the most, uh, the popular business entity as of late has been the LLC. Uh, that gives you the flexibility of a partnership, also gives you the protection of a, a corporation. It gives you the protection of that corporate veil. Uh, believing in oral agreements or failing to believe. Um, oral agreements can be an enforceable, depending on what type of agreement. Certain agreements must be in writing um, that may not apply to the entertainment industries, but just for your own knowledge, um, contracts in which marriage is the consideration, marital agreements must be in writing. Uh, contracts that cannot be performed within one year must be in writing. Contracts in which land is the consideration must be in writing, such as uh, land sale transactions, leaseholds, because land is considered unique. And then contracts, uh, ex executorships uh, must be in writing, which are contracts for on behalf of a decedent, uh, contracts for goods uh, over a certain amount must be in writing, and contracts for a suretyship to satisfy the debts of another must also be in writing. Um, still, um, no matter what kind of agreement you have, I would recommend to have it uh, reduced in writing. Um, oral contracts, um, are difficult to prove when you get into court <clears throat> because as a litigator especially when someone comes to me and says oh we had an oral contract it's like oh like you know how what how are we going to prove it to the jury what this agreement was was when it's he said versus she said it's, it's going to be very difficult um a contract in essence is a meeting of the minds Contract law was formed to hold people to their promises. And the most difficult aspect is to get down to what exactly was their promises. Where was the obligation? What were the duties on the parties? Where was the reciprocal bargain for exchange? What was the, the essence of this deal? That is the most difficult point. Uh, certain states have developed a body of law called implied in fact contract. Uh, New York and California have both developed this area of law uh, by court decisions, give, uh, a, provide to, as the circumstances of a business arrangement, then the courts will imply based on those facts that there is an agreement uh, between the parties. And this is important for people uh, pitching ideas. Uh, historically in Hollywood, people who, uh, gone to studios or uh, powerful executives have been taken advantage of when they pitched ideas. And so the courts have developed an area of law to hold people to um, compensate others if they take their idea. Because in the entertainment industries, uh, ideas are very valuable. Those are very valuable assets in these particular industries. The general rule is that ideas are as free as the air. And there's, in the law, there's a particular person that we label as the blurt out person. Uh, someone, for example, goes to a cafe and just blurts out a great idea over a conversation. Someone hears that idea and then goes with it and develops it and profits off it. That idea, based on that setting, is not uh, protected. It, they, it's as free as they are. Uh, however, if you have... Uh, a meeting at someone's place of business, if you've uh, memorialized things within emails and in writing saying that you have an expectation that you'll be compensated if this information is used in any way, then those facts will lend to a uh, implied in fact agreement. Very difficult to prove again as well.
So again, it's just please document, 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 create your paper trail because as an attorney, uh, a litigator and a trial attorney, we need to be able to prove things. Create your paper trail. Uh, believing the corporate shield is all powerful. Um, depending on what type, type of form uh, it is, you'll have a, a corp, what we call a corporate shield. Uh, you can separate your, your it gives you uh, a shield from personal liability. Uh, anything in, done in the course of that business, uh, only the assets of that business may be at risk if there's any uh, liability, creditors or any uh, judgments. Um, your personal assets are protected. So that's one of the main reasons why people form uh, business entities. Um, the partnership is a different type of business entity and your personal assets may not be protected depending on what, what type of partnership it is because there's also different variations of partnerships. There's what we call a general partnership and also a limited liability partnership. Um, as I said before, the more popular business entity for uh, startups, uh, uh, entertainment uh, industry businesses is if you can get, you can form a, a corporation um, and again, I would also consult with a, um, you know, a, a someone, uh, usually an accountant. Um, a C, you, I consult a lot of times with a CPA when developing these types of business entities. Is the corporate shield, when is the corporate shield not in effect? Because I think a lot of times people don't know that. Right. That's what we call piercing the corporate veil. So anytime you're using it to commit a fraud, uh, you will not be protected by the corporate veil. If you are commingling your assets, you will not be protected by the corporate veil. Um, anytime you're not using the corporation properly, if it's not for a proper business, proper and legal business purpose, you will not be protected. Um, so you just have to follow the law and you can't mix assets. You have to keep, uh, you got to keep it clean. You got to keep the house in order, basically. Um, mm -hmm. Keep separate bank accounts you know, for your personal account and your business account. Um, because once you start mingling funds, the lines start to get blurred. And it's when those lines get blurred, when the corporate veil can be pierced. So, and, and that's a, a powerful tool in litigation. And we allege, you know, piercing the corporate veil all the time. Uh, because, you know, we have to find out, uh, we have to get to all the assets. And if there's wrongdoing, we're going to allege piercing that corporate veil. Because many times, many times people use these business entities to, as shells uh, to commit frauds. Um, they're what we call a shell corporation. And that's not proper. And labor laws do apply. A hot issue in the entertainment industries are the use of interns. If you are, uh, if, if someone is, essentially serving as an employee you have to comply with labor laws yeah if they if you have control over the means of their production if you if they're not free to come and go if they're uh, exerting labor you have to follow the laws and pay them minimum wage uh, you can't get free labor it's not uh it's you don't uh, support involuntarily involuntary servitude uh, many times people ask me, well, what if I exchange things like if there's a, if they get credit or um, even if they get credit, if they are, um, if you're treating them basically as an employee, uh, they're entitled to get compensation. So I would be very uh, careful. Just always fairly compensate uh, people that are providing work, even with independent contractors. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you have an independent contractor agreement, if it comes down to, uh, you know, assent, benefit, and control, if you are controlling the the means, the tools, the tools for production, if you, if they're coming to your location, if they're not free to basically act independently, then they're going to be considered an employee, and you got to pay them uh, minimum wage. You have to fairly compensate them, and then you also have to comply with. Uh, labor laws such as workers' comp insurance and pay the appropriate taxes.
So what to do when business deals start to fall apart? Remain calm. Um, many times when disputes arise, people act emotional, but I would always remain calm. calm. And if you have an attorney that you can consult with, I would uh, reach out to them and see what, be informed of what your legal rights are, whether you have been wronged or whether you need to do anything to remedy a situation. Or if you have done something in which you incurred liability, what can you do to uh, reduce the liability? Protect your personal assets uh, because you have, that, you have property that could be at risk. So why would you want to expose that, those uh, assets to uh, any potential liability when you could create a whole new LLC and whatever is in that business entity would be at risk and not what you've accumulated individually, personally over time. One thing I should say is that uh, business entities, um, a corporation can be liable for uh, wrongdoing. It can also be uh, commit, it can also commit criminal acts. It could be liable for criminal li violations. Uh, it can be sued and it can sue. It is essentially its own entity. It's, it's a legal fiction. It's its own person in the law. Do not involve third parties who are not your attorney. Uh, again, when you can, when you speak to an attorney, you have, uh, your, this is a confidential relationship. What is spoken to an attorney is privileged. It cannot, uh, it cannot be forced to be disclosed uh, in any type of situation unless very few, very few exceptions. Cease and desist letters, letters I would send to the person uh, who you believe is uh, basically infringing on your work is the most general situation or interfering with your business relations. Uh, you want to just keep it in house, you know. To the send it to the person you believe who is doing the wrong thing. It's once you open the can of worms and you start, you know, you start sending it out to uh, basically uh, anyone who may have any contact with the person that you think you're dealing with. We have to be very careful, right? Because you yourself can incur liability for interfering with. Uh, that other party's business relations. Generally speaking, uh, you can't record someone without their permission. Uh, you can't record someone unless it's voluntary, uh, if cons unless consent was given. Uh, there, depending on the jurisdiction, there may be an exception if there's the, a commission of a felony. We have rights of privacy in this country. We have a reasonable expectation of privacy. So, for example, if you're in your trailer, uh, you don't be you're, you don't have an expectation that you'll be filmed in your trailer. I mean, that's your area of privacy. Um, so you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, but many times, that's also a, a a balancing act. For example, I mean, there's case law in there that you know back when marijuana was illegal people would be growing marijuana in their backyard um, even with a fenced in area right mm -hmm. but there'd be a helicopter you know over top it and there was nothing over t on top of the the backyard and they would spot the marijuana growing in the yard and and there's no expectation of privacy there i mean they would allege that hey we, we have privacy here um, you can't just uh, invade our privacy there. No, you don't have an expectation of privacy. There's nothing covering it. And first of all, it was illegal. You don't have an uh, expectation of privacy to conduct illegal acts. Uh, things to say and avoid saying when someone threatens to sue you. Um, again, I spoke about the vexatious litigant, uh, someone who brings frivolous claims. Uh, you don't want to be the person loosely threatening lawsuits. Uh, first of all, it's bad business. People will be scared to do business with you. Uh, and you could be labeled a vexatious litigant and you could bring frivolous claims, which you could be liable uh, for uh, bringing those lawsuits to begin with. The best course of action is simply to stop dealing with that uh, particular party. 
in contacting an attorney. When someone starts to threaten uh, litigation with you, what do you gain from continuing that relationship? It's just uh, a recipe for disaster. They're already uh, asserting an, an adversarial position. So I would consult with an attorney and know what your rights are and be protected. As an attorney, we serve as your representative. We serve as your legal representation. We represent your interests and our duties are owed to you. Uh, we have fiduciary duties owed to the client. Mm -hmm. So uh, no matter what we say, what we do, how we act, uh, we must act in the best interests of our clients. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when, there's, when we're dealing with uh, certain parties, we have to make it known that we represent this client. You know, that this is our client. We represent their interests so that the other person is informed that I am working for this person. All right, because my duties are owed to them. In order for you, the other party, to be uh, advised, you have to get your own attorney. You know, mm -hmm. I, a lot of times when there's disputes that happen, uh, you know, the other party will call me up and you know say, "Oh, well, you know, what's this? What's that?" And I have to tell them, I can't advise you. The only advice that I can give to anyone who's not my client is to speak to a, another attorney speak to an independent counsel so that you are properly advised. My client thinks they've been wrong and they want me to, you know, reach out to try to serve as some form of medi mediator in a certain situation. I have to tell the other party, you know, I've been retained by this party. I represent their interests. And, you know, I strongly advise you to seek your own counsel because this is, uh, now we have attorneys involved and there's legal rights at stake tell you what to do. Preparing to win the court battles you hope you never have. Um, do business with people you know. Uh, we spoke about that earlier. Um, also, surprisingly though, much litigation does arise between family members. So even family members uh, may be difficult people to do business with. Follow the formalities. Do the paperwork. File it with the proper, if you're creating a business, file your, your corporate documents with the proper uh, state. Uh, do things the right way. Do not cut corners because the, uh, what you pay now will save you later. Do things right now uh, so that you don't have to pay the costs later. Have the right insurance for the work you are doing. There's different insurance issues involved for uh, a, pro a project production, uh, there's general liability insurance, uh, there's workers comp insurance, and for creative content, uh, publishers, uh, artists, creators, there's E&O insurance, errors and omissions insurance. Litigation can take a very long time. There's many cases that can go on for many, many years, and it's a process. Uh, there's the discovery process, the truth-seeking process of getting the evidence. Uh, a trial is not a, a surprise attack. Uh, there are no surprises at trial. Uh, it is a process. Uh, all the evidence has to come out so that the jury's, jury can weigh all the evidence. Um, it, it's, a, you know, it's a marathon. Many cases can take many, many years. The courts are very backed up. Uh, they've done a, a very good job uh, at um, uh, basically uh, developing uh, the independent calendar and, and having certain cases uh, being um, uh, coordinated in certain departments. Uh, but it's a very difficult task. Uh, I think the uh, civil courts do the best they can. But it's, you know, there is just a, um, there's an overload. You mentioned that if somebody has, if somebody has a, that for the, for a dollar amount under $10,000 or something like that in Los Angeles, you can take someone to the small claims court. Uh, generally, it's supposed to be a faster process. It's more efficient. You don't engage in the uh, discovery process like you would in a unlimited or limited jurisdiction. 
Mm -hmm. It's more of a uh, uh, informal uh, court setting as compared to uh, the unlimited and limited jurisdiction. So they've developed these small claims uh, jurisdictions within the, the court systems, the unlimited jurisdiction and the limited jurisdiction. Unlimited is cases of $25,000 or less, and that has uh, another set of uh, restricted discovery that may be conducted. Mm -hmm. is more you can get to trial more quicker than uh, an unlimited case. Uh, mm -hmm. A limited case, for example, you can only do a certain number of depositions, uh, not as many as you can do in a limited, uh, unlimited jurisdiction. Unlimited mm -hmm. jurisdiction is $25,000 or more. The thing is, though, you know, you're capped. Mm -hmm. uh, in an unlimited jurisdiction, you cannot recover more than 25000 Same with small claims. You cannot recover more than $10,000. You are capped by bringing cases into those jurisdictions. Right. Uh, but then there's also um, certain uh, cases, uh, for example, if you bring a case in unlimited jurisdiction, which would have been better off brought in unlimited, you may be uh, forced to pay attorney's fees on the other side or expert mm -hmm. costs on the other side. Um, so you really have to consider whether this is the right type of case for this jurisdiction. That's why you go to it. That's why you're going to an attorney. If you want to bring one of those cases, you would go to an attorney and you can get the advice before you go into court. It's just, as long as people realize that they're not, there's, there is effective relief through the courts, you know, for the small matters that most of us have to deal with every day. Cause otherwise they'll get the idea that suing people or being sued is so terrible that the court systems are basically not even there. Hmm. You know, so do you want to move on to the next slide? Yep. So you wanted to put, the reason we put this information is, is in is because it's some of the biggest risks that we here in Hollywood face are, have to do with equity investments, right? Because they it, an, ab, absolutely involve you with, you know, the laws of the Securities and Exchange Commission. So do you want to talk a little about why people have to be careful when they're, make, when they're involving themselves in taking money from investors? Securities is a is defined broadly in the law. So a, a security is basically uh, an investment, uh, anything in which you're giving money uh, to uh, someone else where you expect a return and the success or failure of that will be done, will be uh, determined by the other party that you don't have a say in whether that uh, venture succeeds or fails. That is a security. Uh, we were speaking earlier uh, before the presentation about certain loans and you know whether you call something a loan or not it could be considered a security so it's important to consult with a, an attorney when you're accepting investments um, because when investors do not get their money back or they do not see the return that they were promised uh, they're going to be filing lawsuits because no one likes to just give money away. They're going to want to get that money back. So it's important that you have proper disclosure documents in place so that you're, you're protected, that you're, you don't, uh, you're not found liable for securities fraud. And securities fraud can also be a, a crime as well. Right, which means would definitely, it would definitely pierce the corporate veil and that means your personal assets would be um, on the line. I mean, not to mention criminal activity. <laughs> right. Well, there, there's certain tests. I mean, there's, there's definitions in uh, the acts and the regulations. Uh, courts have come up with tests as well for determining whether a certain transaction is considered a security. Uh, the landmark case, uh, the uh, Howey Doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, is how they determine what a uh, security is. Basically, any type of investment is considered a security. It's very broad, um, and it, it was done that it was it was defined so broadly so that people um, are held accountable. It's about accountability. It's about full disclosure. It's about uh, people being informed and not taken advantage of. Um, 
because there's a lot of con what we call confidence men out there people who are uh, securing the confidence of others um, basically with the knowledge that they're not going to deliver that's what we call con men uh, mm -hmm. confidence men um, so uh, securities laws were developed in order to protect the investing um, the investing public and one of the one of the things that you'd mentioned is that the securities laws control who you can pitch your project to how you can pitch your project the terms under which you accept the investment how you keep your investors informed after they've given you in the in investment so it, there are a lot of rules that govern um, govern your behavior throughout the process and violating them um, is easy if you don't know what they are. Can you can you talk about, can every attorney help you put together a, a private placement memorandum or a security or are there, special, are there attorneys who specialize in just that job? There are attorneys that do specialize in securities. Uh, it is very uh, nuanced. It is a niche area and I highly advise to work with a securities lawyer if you are uh, in the business of seeking investments uh, uh, because you do not, you want to uh, make sure everything you say is truthful and not misleading. Uh, there are documents that must be uh, prepared, um, private placement memorandums, um, which is the most mostly used document, disclosure document, uh, should be prepared and these are very in-depth documents that serve to protect you. So they protect you or they protect the people that you're supporting? Well, they, they inform the investor of the risk and essentially uh, notify them that they may not seek a return or they may not receive a return, that they are uh, making this investment with the full knowledge that uh, they may never see any return on this and they may not get their money back. Does this mean that it can be a problem if I have, if I set up a company and I tell my employees that I'm going to give them a percentage of the business in return for their services? Am I in effect creating and turning them into investors? If you are saying that you will give them a, share in the profits in the business in exchange for services? Uh, have you just uh, turned them into investors? Uh, yeah, their they're, uh, labor, uh, they're exerting their labor in exchange for something. Uh, that, um, but if they, it depends, it depends on how you define that um, because they have control of whether it succeeds or fails. They're essentially becoming uh, ownership. You know, they right. are uh, active participants in this business rather mm -hmm. than passive. Uh, again, it's whether uh, they have the ability to control whether it succeeds or fails. Then mm -hmm. it's uh, they are considered a passive investor, and it's a security. It's the, it's controlled by securities laws. Uh, in mm -hmm. that situation, if they do have the ability to control whether a certain business succeeds or fails, uh, they're considered active and you may be um, exempted by the securities laws uh, right. and they may be considered uh, owners. It depends on how you're uh, basically are arranging this, uh, this relationship, whether you're giving them equity, whether you're just giving them some form of uh, back end compensation, it all comes down to characterization. Right. Well, and I think the reason I mentioned it is just because I, I've worked on projects where people say, well, you know, we're just setting up the company, but, you know, we'll, uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to get a percentage of the company. And it's like, I'm, I'm always sitting there thinking, well, you can't, you're offering to, you're, you're starting to offer a security and I don't even know and you're doing it on an informal basis and you don't know if I'm an accredited investor. There just seems a lot wrong. <laughs> but so people should talk to a security. If you, if you want to plan to um, reward your employees with a percentage of your business, or a percentage of your company, you should definitely work with a securities attorney to, to have that conversation. So you know 
what kind of relationship you're creating. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think you were, I think this is a smart thing to make, to, to call out specifically because here in Hollywood, every company is that people set up is involves security because security is almost. And then you were, this, this is something you said was particularly important. Well, there are different, there are standards on how, uh, we as members of the community are expected to act and same with a business uh, uh, a business is held to this same standard and if you're uh, considered more experienced or knowledgeable in a certain area you may be held to a higher industry standard on how to act I mean, we all have the uh, the basic standard of care to act or to act carefully um, in the law there's a hypothetical standard that they refer that the courts refer to as the reasonable prudent person uh, when we're dealing with negligence law. Uh, negligence law is essentially uh, when you uh, fail to meet the proper standard of care and harm is the result, um, then you can incur liability. It's, uh, there must be a, uh, a duty, uh, a breach of that duty, uh, a causation, uh, and damages, duty, breach, causation, and damages in order for someone to be held liable for negligence. And usually that duty is to uh, act as a re reasonable, prudent person under these situations, under the, these circumstances. Um, and that consists of a, a duty of care. Um, if, again, if you are more experienced in certain activities, you could be held to a higher standard. I like your description of a reasonable, prudent person. Do you want to just sort of read it out loud? Because it's pretty funny. It's fictional. It's a <laughs> fictional creation. And in the law, a reasonable, prudent person, um, again, would not uh, consume alcohol, never uh, any uh, altering substances, never makes a mistake, always takes all possible safety precautions, makes all warnings. It's a very highly critical <laughs> standard i mean uh it's the basic standard of care but it is still very high um it's not the average person mm -hmm. um, i mean average people make mistakes but still that reasonable prudent person standard um the reasonable prudent person acts safe all the time right so the, the reasonable prudent person standard can be if somebody's a, a real estate professional and um, when they go into a negotiation to buy real estate, they're held to a higher standard than just a normal person buy, buying real estate because they're, they know more of the laws. So like you were talking about the fact that sometimes lawyers are held to a higher standard because, because of the profession that they're in. They're expected not only just to, to obey the reasonable, reasonable, prudent person standard, but also the reasonable, prudent lawyer standard, which is something that expects even more of people. Well, for professional legal malpractice claims, uh, that's when uh, an attorney didn't satisfy their uh, standard of, mm -hmm. uh, a legal, of the legal professional. Um, it is a higher standard, uh, and it's, it's a critical standard. You know, comparatively, uh, a child is held to the standard of... Uh, a child of the same age under the same situations. So mm -hmm. is that, you know, does that also make sense? That, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a child who commits a, a, a tort uh, is expected to act as a, uh, a like child in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, so there's different standards and that's a legal argument to be made by the attorneys and it's going to be determined by the court. Uh, mm -hmm. The court would instruct the jury on what standard applies because that is a question of law. Um, the court determines questions of law. The mm -hmm. jury determines questions of facts. Mm -hmm. And the standard, the appropriate standard of care in certain cases is a question of law. And attorneys will make the argument as to what standard should apply in this particular case, but the judge will ultimately say that this is the standard. Uh, the mm -hmm. judge has the, the say on that. So we, you're saying we should all choose to be 
as best as possible when we're doing business, doing business, reasonable, prudent people. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's the, that's the, the law. That's the law that that will be applied. That's generally speaking, the law that will be applied to us. So if an, if a reasonable, prudent person who saw a bunch of cables on the floor that were not taped down, would tape them down or would stop, you know, would stop production in order to tape, to make sure the set was safe, choosing not to do that is taking on the liability of running an unsafe set with a bunch of cables for people to trip over. Mm -hmm. We're getting into uh, possess. I mean, if you're speaking of premises, mm -hmm. Uh, sets premises someone who has control of that property does not necessarily have to be the owner of the property but the person who exercised control of that property could be liable uh, under premises liability if someone were to uh, get injured from those uh, wires not being secured uh, and again if it's on a uh, you know if it's on a business uh, in which you're inviting it there's again it gets into um the legal status of mm -hmm. the parties right uh, for example if you have this type of premise open to the public you're inviting them out in right it could be considered an invitee uh, in, uh relationship um in which um there's more duties you have a duty to uh actively inspect the premises to make safe right. whereas if you're not inviting public in i mean you don't have to take those active uh, precautions beforehand it's right. different legal status and that's those are always a question of law right that makes total sense cool so actually we have a bunch of questions that are in chat we might as well go ahead and take a look at those right off the bat at what point should you ask? I think you answered the question a little about what at what point a freelancer should create their own company. Do you want to talk for a few minutes? Just review, make sure people understand that, um, understand when they sh you think they should do that. I think they should do that if they have personal assets in their name. Mm -hmm. uh, if creating a new uh, project or mm -hmm. uh, you're entering into business relationships with uh, other parties mm -hmm. and you have assets in your own name, I would form a, a separate business entity to conduct this uh, business so that your personal assets are protected. Um, if you don't have so much personal assets, maybe you may want to just, you know, per, you know, pursue this business venture as a sole proprietor. Um, is that, is that risky in the sense that you may actually end up acquiring assets in the future that become at risk? because you did business as a sole proprietor. I mean, what does it mean to be a sole proprietor as opposed to being an LLC? I mean, I would always, as an attorney, I, was, I would always advise on forming uh, a separate business entity because it gives you another layer of protection. Um, unfortunately, some people just find it more easier to uh, pursue uh, as a sole proprietor, less formalities. Uh, basically no formalities it's all personal income uh, whereas if you create a separate business entity you have to follow the uh, corporate formalities uh, you have to file with the uh, secretary of state you have to get a tax identification number you have to file statements of information if it's an LLC you have to file um, uh, annual reports and um, with the Secretary of State, uh, you got to file your articles of organization for a corporation. Um, and there's just formalities that have to be followed. And there are attorneys that do handle uh, the corporate formalities because, um, and there's also attorneys that uh, I ha that associates of mine that handle basically cleaning up the books. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that has to be done if your business ultimately becomes successful and now you, you want to have a merger and acquisition, but you don't have all the books in order. And now you have to basically clean up the books. You got to make sure, and it's not necessarily like go back in time and, you know, create these documents. It's uh, basically uh, what these type of attorneys will do is they'll go back through email exchanges and find out what uh, substantial changes in that business 
uh, were done at particular times because those things do have to be on the corporate minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the important thing is that if people should should set up a separate entity if they're going to be doing business, um, and they have currently have have assets or in the future plan to have assets that that um, they don't want to be at risk. Generally speaking, could you talk? Um, the next question is actually kind of interesting, and I spe especially here in Hollywood, what happens if you record people who said it was okay at the time, posted it on YouTube? And then they came back and said they never agreed to be filmed because that's that does happen here. Um, well, if you have any emails, uh, anything where you can uh, m have some form of memorialization, because this one isn't really uh, you know being recorded without their consent. This is really about uh, what was the meeting of the minds because you guys are creating uh, content here. Mm -hmm. What was the agreement amongst the, the parties? And this, again, comes down to what is the essence of uh, this transaction? Uh, it's always very best to have things in writing, as we mm -hmm. talked about before. But if you recorded them, if they right before they did something stupid, if you recorded them, and you said, hey, is it okay if I recorded you? If I record you, would that count as them giving consent? Yes. I mean, that would be... Uh, I mean, saying I give consent that this be recorded would be uh, more powerful if you have that. You know, basically say, yes, I agree to have this recorded. But again, in this type of situation, when you're putting things out there to the public on YouTube, yeah, I would make sure you have consent. Uh, when, you, when you're using someone else's likeness, image, voice, um, because you're, again, I evaluate exposure. You put in, you're putting things out there on YouTube for uh, who knows how many people can see that. You know, anybody can see it if they do the proper search. It's open to basically the public. And you want to be careful because if uh, you're defaming this person, you know, if you're portraying this uh, other individual in a um, disparaging way, any kind of way, you can incur liability. And there's publication to a number of uh, third parties. And that's what's needed for def defamation. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, defamation and those things, if, if somebody, you know, they always have those movies like um, those, those crazy kids where I think they were in San Diego and they were, they were beating up bums and they, they were recording it, beating up, they were committing a crime. And I think they were doing it to be recorded. And then people, it was getting posted. I mean, they really can't say, come back later and say, we didn't, we didn't want you to record and disseminate this information about us committing a crime because it's defamation, because they're actually doing something, which is like... Well, first of all, truth is an absolute defense to defamation. So right. if it's true, you can't say it's defamatory. Right. Uh, true is the commission of a crime. And it could, it's uh, evidence of a criminal uh, act. So this is just... Uh, you know, this type of situation is just, you know, it's just wrong. You know, right. It's just, you know, it's flat, flat, plain wrong. Uh, rights are afforded to law-abiding citizens, mm -hmm. not to those who commit wrongs and, and crimes and frauds. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be protected by the law if you're uh, committing a crime or a fraud. That makes total sense. Actually, um, there's another question we got, which I wanted to... Um, put up. Um, I have a co-writing partner and our project has been registered with the WGA and I've lost interest in the project. How do I sever legal ties on the project and does she now have full rights to the intellectual property? Can you address that's how often do you see that kind of problem? Uh, it, it comes up um, when people collaborate on, um, on projects. Uh, co-writing agreements should be put in writing uh, absolutely should be put in writing. Um, joint authorships always, you know, create disputes. Um, again, with the WGA, it's evidence of, uh, you know, a, the date when this work was created. The mm -hmm. work should be registered with the Copyright Office in order to be afforded uh, certain legal rights and remedies. But in this issue, uh, the 
the main issue here is the uh, joint authorship and the co-writing agreement. Um, so it, again, it should be in writing. There should be a uh, basically a clause in there uh, for when this type of uh, situation arises and what the uh, royalties will be for this work if in the case someone wants to abandon this project. Uh, but it, if she doesn't have that stuff by already that right now what she currently has is a joint copyright. She yeah. wasn't registered at the copyright office but she has, shares copyright on a project. They both have equal ownership apparently. And, and, and then that too uh, is something I would want to uh, inv investigate more into because what is her claim to a, a joint on, uh, authorship here if there is nothing in writing, if there is no co-writing uh, agreement? Uh, how are you claiming uh, joint ownership into this piece of work? What was your contribution to the work? And again, uh, in order to contribute uh, anything, um, it's a minimal amount, you know, it just has to be something more than just mere editing. Anything that created to the originality of this work could give you a, a, a joint, a claim of joint authorship. I've come across disputes like this because it comes down into a, a dispute of ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, you know, I faced defenses where they said that uh, you know, my client was merely working as uh, an employee and they were acting under his supervision. And they weren't, and therefore as an employee, uh, the rights automatically go to the employer. You know, they mm -hmm. weren't, it wasn't a co-writing uh, partnership, but you were acting under my supervision. Um, and so therefore I own all the rights. It's a question of who has the rights. So I think, if, yeah, if, if people have additional questions, can they reach out to you via phone or how can they, I guess you provided your contact information, but um, should we tell them to, to contact you via the sterlingfirm.com? Would that be the easiest way for them to reach out to you going forward? Sure. Uh, you can also feel free to give me a call, phone number 310-498-2750. Uh, you can also feel free to email me as well, email justin at the sterlingfirm.com. Uh, you can also reach out through the website. Uh, we're happy to be of service, and uh, I try to respond to inquiries as quickly as possible. Um, if you guys have any questions, do reach out to me at nancy.fulton at yahoo.com or reach out to Justin Sterling at thesterlingfirm.com. Um, we're always available to be of service to you. And um, I look forward to seeing you on our uh, – I don't think we have any calls scheduled to come up um, for the near future, but I look forward – to seeing you at future events, you can go to um, Nancy, the Nancy Fulton Meetups site, and you'll be able to see um, all the stuff that's coming up. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, having me on, Nancy, and I appreciate all the service that you provide. And uh, I know that uh, the members of your groups uh, gain so much by um, you know being involved with you because I know you you put a lot of time and effort. In. You're very sweet. It's very kind of you to say. I want to say thank you and everyone have a good night. All right, good night, you guys. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.